Love didn't just happen to us. We built it slowly over the years, stone by stone. For you, for your brothers and sisters, for all of us. It's not as exciting as secret passion in the woods, but it is stronger. Catelyn Tully, or Catelyn Stark, or Cat, or Lady Stoneheart, or according to this video I found by the Order of the Green Hand. A conniving, selfish, and deplorable sociopath. Catelyn Tully is the worst person that's ever lived. That's certainly one opinion. Catelyn Stark is a very interesting character who does make a lot of mistakes and I think people condemn her for it. You know, there's a big audience that despises Catelyn either as a complete idiot, uh, kind of the way Ned Stark is dismissed as an honourable fool, or people who see her as downright evil. What I do in these videos isn't defend characters. They have flaws and make bad decisions and we don't excuse those things, but we do still try to understand where it all comes from. You know, I'm a therapist, of course my focus is on understanding rather than judgement, however we are still going to discuss some of the audience opinion about her in this video and some slight defence of parts of her I suppose in the end section. Look when I type the words Catelyn and psychology into YouTube to check that what I want to say doesn't accidentally copy someone else's videos, the only content I find on her is this long multiple part series titled Why Catelyn Sucks and it does bother me a little. I would like to be a differing voice. You know, is Catelyn flawed? Of course. Is she a conniving, selfish, deplorable sociopath? Absolutely not. So we will get into that. We'll discuss Jon Snow and Lady Stoneheart, her relationship with Rob and her siblings, and some of the political decisions she makes. Most importantly though, when I took the time to reread all of Catelyn's chapters, I realised there's some very interesting patterns you can pick out to her behaviour. Things I'd not noticed until I saw them charted out that do tell us a lot about who she is. So yeah, I've made lots of these videos on other characters. I have a playlist dedicated just to Game of Thrones slash A Song of Ice and Fire character analyses or another playlist for all of my character analyses videos. Check them out if you're interested. Otherwise, let's just start. So it makes sense to begin in childhood, because Catelyn has an interesting upbringing. Her parents were Lord Hostetali and Lady Manisa, who actually had two children before Catelyn, two sons who both died in infancy. And it's hard to know much about the effect this had, because we never meet Manisa, and Hosta is dying when he comes into the story. However, we do get this interesting quote. Her two older brothers had both died in infancy. So she had been son as well as daughter to Lord Hoster until Edmure was born. Which in terms of that wording suggests more than just Catelyn being considered the heir until a son was born. She is cherished both as a son and a daughter. She is somewhat filling the hole that these two sons probably left before her. I know one quote isn't much evidence to go on there, but it's the best information we get. And if that is the case, that's hard for any child, I think. On the one hand, it might play into them cherishing Catelyn massively, how grief can melt into hope and love and be a good thing, but on the other hand, it's a lot of pressure for her, filling the shoes of everything her parents might have imagined these older boys could have been, whilst also trying to find her own independent identity at the same time. And that is scarce information, but I can't help thinking it would line up well with the knowledge that A. Hostetali loved Catelyn best of all his children, and B. That Catelyn is a very dutiful child. I have always done my duty, she thought. Perhaps that was why her Lord Father had always cherished her best of all his children. You know, Catelyn, from the moment of her birth, is given this duty to fill the whole of the brothers before her. She will also have a sense of duty as the eldest surviving sibling to Lysa and to Edmure when they are born. It's quite common, I think, that elder siblings feel a greater weight of responsibility. And I think because you're then expected to be the most mature of the siblings, that is also a pressure. Not that that stuff is always true, you know, it depends entirely on how the parents actually see and treat this child. They might 
might think quite differently, we don't know, but either way, it does go further still because Lysa is born one year after Catelyn, or possibly three years, it seems George R. R. Martin never said for certain, and I'm basing all of this off the estimates figured out on the a wiki of Ice and Fire page. They estimate that Catelyn was born between the years 264 and 265, that Lysa was born 266 or 267, and then that Edmure was born between 267 and 274, so Catelyn could be anywhere between 3 and 10 years older than Edmure. All of which could make a massive difference, but <laughs> we can't tell. Either way though, sometime between 268 and 278, Lady Manisa died in childbirth to what would be a fourth son, who also then died as well. So I think then the older Catelyn is than her siblings, we don't know the ages for sure, the more sense of responsibility she might then feel for them. And if we do follow those dates, Catelyn is anywhere between 1 and 12 years old when her mother dies. We can probably rule out her being too young because Catelyn does have some memories of Manisa. But anyway, she dies and Hoster tells Catelyn that she now must be the Lady of Riverrun. So that's even more pressure and responsibility and expectation on top of everything already, leaving us with someone who feels she has to be as dutiful as possible. Someone who is literally trying to fill the gaps in the family, and this side to Catelyn will come to see that almost grits her teeth and tries to do as she's supposed to do sort of. Um, I suspect you're already imagining examples later in the story where she does the opposite of what she's expected to do. Yes, we'll come to all of that, but for now, someone who does her duty and she is loved for it. It makes her Hoster's favourite. Perhaps also again because she's trying to sort of fill the hole of Hoster's wife. From a young age, grief has a lot to do with Catelyn, I think, so keep that in mind as well. But yes, she plays the role of son as well as daughter, then as Lady of River and then she is matched to Brandon Stark and she had thanked him for making such a splendid match. All of which is stuff that will become more important later into the video when we come to looking at the adult Catelyn Stark, but first, I think it's worth talking about her siblings and the kind of relationship she has with them beyond just being the dutiful favourite child, so what more can we pick apart there? Let's discuss that after the bit you've all come to expect and love. Yes, World Anvil are still sponsoring me. This is a company I genuinely love. I'm going to keep promoting and supporting them as long as I physically can. <laughs> and all of you are going to listen intently. Um, World Anvil is an online tool for world building, character creation, story planning and writing, campaign building and playing lots of different games. A load of useful stuff. I use it for my novel with the sprawling mess all of my world building turned into and even just like I was keen on my fictional town having a strong sense of community so there was pages after page of who lives where, what do they think of their neighbours, where do they work, what are their opinions on local gossip, I don't know, a very big sprawling mess that World Anvil can really help to organise with hyperlinks, different categories, timelines, you can even completely build out of your own designed calendars. Again with hyperlinks attached to other articles and a map to link the different timeline events to if you fancy that. When there is so much detail it is hard to remember it all and having something like this to just quickly glance at and see what happens where and when becomes so damn handy. And there are other tools as well, I've not used all of them yet myself but all the ones I have used are pretty straightforward. They do have lots of tutorials for how to use everything but I've never needed to watch them, I've just figured it out myself pretty easily. There is a link in the description and as a pinned comment there is the code TREE which entitles you to 40% off any of their yearly subscriptions. And if you want to try it out first, they have a free version. Test that out for as long as you like first. Get familiar with World Anvil, you know. If you're interested, click the link. World Anvil. Now, um, what was I talking about before? Right, uh, so as mentioned, we've got two younger siblings that survived. Lysa, who is between one and three years younger, and Edmure, who is between three and ten years younger. As I've said, Catelyn is the eldest and seemingly the favoured child, which could mean very little, you know, I strongly suspect that these are parents who loved all their children. From what we see as them as adults, I think we can infer their parents were better than, say, Tywin Lannister is as a parent, for example, um, but nonetheless. I look at Lysa 
nicer and I do feel there is quite a strong sibling rivalry with Catelyn. Probably a fair bit of envy, seen best in how Peter Baelish, this other child who was sent to be raised with them at River Run, becomes a kind of object to play out their rivalry. A competition between the sisters to win his love, or childish games of romance, or be his favourite, at least that's how Lysa saw it I think. For Catelyn, Peter is just innocently starting to explore what romance and all that stuff is without any greater weight attached. But for Lysa I think it much more represents triumph over Catelyn. I'll win Peter's heart, that will show my sister, I'll make him love me as favourite. Which again, if Catelyn is the favoured child of her parents, that would be quite poignant. Lysa and Peter end up having sex the night Catelyn's betrothal to Brandon is announced, that seems poignant as well. Peter also later ends up impregnating her, and when Hoster finds out about this, he sends Peter away and forces Lysa to abort the child through the herb tansy and moon tea, a process which almost kills her, and then leaves her struggling to have further children except from her one child Robert, who she then is fiercely overprotective of. And this video isn't about Lysa, but in that context we can understand a lot of Lysa's behaviour at the Eerie later in the story. She was jealous of Catelyn, who seemed to end up with a perfect husband and children. She had one child she loved with the person she loved that was forced to be aborted. She almost died from it, she was forced to marry a man she didn't want to marry, and only then was able to have one child. A child that then is all she has in the world. I think the rivalry though is kind of made worse because Catelyn never did really care about Peter in that way. Catelyn is placed somewhat above them, I guess you could say. Peter is just this person to explore childish ideas of romance, rather than someone she might actually become genuinely attached to, and bring a lot of those complications into the mix. You know, Catelyn just sees Peter as sweet and harmless, which probably is a massive reason she makes the mistake of trusting him in book one and convincing her husband to trust Peter as well. And that is a big mistake of hers, but yeah, we can imagine how that made Peter feel. For him to very much feel he loves her, but for her to not reciprocate that, and just to see him as this sweet, harmless thing to explore what childish romance means. And also Lysa, who hopes winning Peter gives her something over Catelyn, some level of triumph, but A, Peter still loves Catelyn better regardless of what Lysa does, and B, Catelyn doesn't even care. It's quite sad going through all these Catelyn chapters, noting this subtle undercurrent that Lysa has big rivalrous feelings towards her sister, and Catelyn never even really notices them. Kind of like the rivalry is so beneath her now, you know, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, that I think is her maturing and moving on from sibling rivalries in those sort of ways, and becoming a much more rounded person, but for Lysa who hasn't managed to do that, that must hurt, that must add to the sting. Lysa who just wants to feel better than her sister and be the envied one for once, the one admired best with all the singers. Again, that's not Catelyn doing anything wrong, but it just must hurt from Lysa's point of view. Edmure, on the other hand, um, possibly one of my favourite characters. The show did him a massive disservice by just turning him into this useless idiot, and he is slightly useless in the books, definitely, but he's also a lovable, slight fool who still does show competence and a lot of care for people, and does perhaps one of the kindest acts anyone does in this brutal Westeros, which is to invite all of the small folk into his castle for food and shelter when the Riverlands are under attack. Their children were everywhere underfoot, and the yard teamed with their cows, sheep, and chickens. Who are all these folk? My people, Edmure answered. They were afraid. Only my sweet brother would crowd all these useless mouths into a castle that might soon be under siege. Catelyn's opinion there on the matter is the common cultural one that almost everyone else in Westeros would share. We have to remember that's not her being bad, that's her thinking strategically, but Edmure putting kindness above that though is just wonderful. That's a tangent. Um, where Catelyn is dutiful, Edmure is very easygoing. For which we then often see Catelyn being very hard on him. There are so, so many quotes of her snapping at him, or slightly putting him down, or whatever. Nothing downright mean, but it is 
is still sad to read, I think. She does dearly love him, but also never quite trusts him to be more than the easygoing little brother, and she just wishes he would be a bit more than that, and a little bit more responsible. And in that I think you can feel a slight resentment from their childhood. I always had to be so responsible over everything. I had to play your role as son and male heir for half my life, alongside everything else I was having to be. I had to show so much duty. Why couldn't you have taken some of the strain? Why couldn't you just be a bit responsible too? That slight feeling, I think, to their dynamic. And from Edmure's point of view, Catelyn is this lot's older, possibly 10 years older, favoured child that he's never been able to equal, so he almost doesn't try. Where Lys is outright jealous, Edmure more sort of looks down on himself and never truly believes his parents are proud of him. There's a heartbreaking moment right before he rides off to battle where Catelyn tells him, He was always proud of you, Edmure. And he loves you fiercely. Believe that. I mean to give him a better reason than mere birth. The poor guy, you know, and then even after this battle that he does win, he ends up feeling down about himself after their father dies. He ought never to have ridden off to fight this battle on the fords, he told her tearfully. He should have stayed at their father's bedside. I should have been with him as you were, he said. So even in that he feels Catelyn was better, he can't win in that sense, and yeah, that's probably a part of why he's so easygoing, and yet I guess also at the same time quite proud and um, an insecurity there I suppose. Constantly feeling like he's never lived up to expectations and then chastising himself for it really. And there could be something of the way that Catelyn looks at Peter like this sweet but harmless little boy in the way she looks at Edmure. There, there could be. And if that is true we can understand why that must frustrate him as well, but again we also have to be aware Catelyn literally may have been 10 years older than him growing up. Of course she looks on him like a much littler brother. Anyway, all of that dynamic I think does lend possibly to an idea that there may have been times Lysa and Edmure alike would have gotten a bit annoyed feeling like why does Catelyn have to be so damn perfect all the time? Why can't we be that? The good and bad to not having all the pressure on you, I guess. You know, I, I'm saying that because I look at comments from people who detest Catelyn as a character, and a lot of the comments slate her as being superior, being holier than thou, sitting on a moral high horse. I think that's a massively unfair criticism to throw her way. However, what we've just discussed in her interactions with Peter and Edmure and Lysa does point to a dynamic people could interpret that way, I suppose. Anyway, the thing I really love about her relationship with Edmure most of all is that despite these feelings she's always had growing up, she does start to reach a point where she doesn't just see him as the little brother anymore. It's still not perfect, no, but I think she does start to recognise that he has grown into his own man, as seen best when she disagrees with his battle plans. Perhaps she was wrong to oppose him. Perhaps it was a splendid plan, and her misgivings were only a woman's fears. His plan will work, Cat. You'll see. I hope so, Edmure. I truly do. She kissed him on the cheek, to let him know that she meant it, and went to find her father. It's a moment of doubt for her, but it's also a moment of choosing to trust her brother knows what he's doing, and I really like that, you know, he goes off and he fights bravely, and his plan does work perfectly, he does a really good job, except it also screws up the much wider plan Rob had been building towards, so that, that's true. All the same, it is a nice moment. Anyway, in all this talking you might still feel like we haven't really gotten anywhere. This is mostly touching on childhoods, on stuff before the events of the story, stuff we don't have much evidence about. So what about the more concrete stuff we see of Catelyn? What can we pull apart there? Let's do that now, starting with loss. By the way, apologies if my voice sounds at all off still. I have had the unspecified illness YouTube doesn't like you mentioning recently. And I think my voice could get away with that in the shorter Last of Us videos I've recorded recently. But this is quite a long one and it's causing a bit of a strain. Anyway, if you can cast your mind back to earlier in this big old video, I said Catelyn's childhood was tied to experiences of grief. Well, 
Grief is kind of the big thing in her storyline, where a lot of Arya's story shows us the horrors of war from the perspective of the ordinary people, Catelyn shows us the grief from the perspective of the Highborn, you know, we don't see the brutal cruelty inflicted onto the small folk from her perspective, but we do get to see the loss of family members, you know, noble knights and heroes who die in half glorious, half awful, ridiculous war. Catelyn's storyline I think reflects a lot of the ideas ideas you see in the Iliad in that sense, um, especially with characters like Priam begging at the feet of Achilles to be allowed to bury his son, to be given the chance to grieve his loss. Nonetheless, the thing I found most interesting about reading back all Catelyn's chapters was noticing that she has this endless, pervasive feeling that something is going to go terribly terribly wrong. I think pretty much every one of her chapters she has thoughts along those lines, even at times when things are going pretty well. Catelyn wished she could share his joy, but she had heard the talk in the yards, a dire wolf dead in the snow, a broken antler in its throat, dread coiled in her like a snake. When it came, she knew it would mean death. Howl's death perhaps, or hers, or Rob's. No one was safe, no life was certain, but if we are winning, why am I so afraid? My favourite example is Chapter 7 in the Game of Thrones, before anything truly disastrous has happened yet. Some caveats. Um, she is at the Eyrie before Tyrion's trial, looking at a waterfall named Alyssa's Tears, after a woman who supposedly saw all her family slain without shedding a tear, and we get... Catelyn wondered how large a waterfall her own tears would make when she died. Which is a hell of a thought, you know? Does she think she's also going to see all of her family murdered? Does she think that when she dies there will be nothing left but grief and tears? That's quite intense. Yes, it's probably foreshadowing. Yes, Bran has been pushed out of the window, even if she is confident he will live by this point. And yes, I think most mothers can very much relate to the absolute dread of your children getting harmed or killed, especially in a world as brutal as Westeros. However, the extreme to which Catelyn has these feelings seem to suggest there's something more to them. Speaking as a therapist, which is what I've been doing this whole video, um, but it's not uncommon, I think, to work with people who have very intense fears that something bad is always going to happen. This overwhelming dread without any clear reason why. Even my girlfriend has always, always had this feeling that she is going to die young. And you know, there are lots of reasons someone might feel that. Really, you'd need to talk to them a lot and slowly work through where it's been coming from for them. Obviously, I can't talk to Catelyn. She's not real. All I can do for the sake of her video is speculate tenuously based on flimsy evidence that you wouldn't really do in real life, but that's what we'll do now. <laughs> I think there's two standout reasons that she might be plagued with these kind of feelings. What is one main reason, obviously, it's that George R. R. Martin thought it would lend more tragedy to her arc if she seems to feel like something bad was going to happen. That's the real reason, but that's also not what we do here. We analyse characters as though they were real people. Yes, they aren't real, and it's a flawed pursuit, but there's still always a lot to gain from the experience of trying. So, two standout reasons. One possible reason, I think, is the death she grew up with as a child, in particular the two sons before her who both died during infancy. I can only wonder, but perhaps Hosta and Manisa, having already lost two children, were now particularly anxious with Catelyn, fearing something bad was going to happen to her too. Fretting all through her infancy, is she going to die in infancy too? Is she okay? Something bad's going to happen, it's going to repeat again. Perhaps half expecting her to pass away too, you know? That could make sense. They might have calmed their fears there a little as Catelyn got older, and especially as they then had other children too who didn't appear to die. But in those earlier stages of Catelyn's life, where there is the most chance that she might die, you know? Infancy is a time the brain is most malleable, when our experiences, the way we are treated and seen and felt about, do have the most effect on us. Even if she was a baby who couldn't understand language or whatever, she could very well still take away a lot from their feelings towards her, something a bit more 
um, primitive and instinctual and unconscious. As I say, when there's a time period where their brains are the most malleable, it's all going to have a big effect on the type of person and personality they might later grow into. Not to say we're chained to the experiences we have during infancy, you know, we can definitely all change, otherwise what would be the point in therapy, but it can be hard, you know? That's definitely possible then. Did she feel their anxiety about something bad happening and then end up internalising it as part of who she is. I think that can make a hell of a lot of sense really, that's one possible reason for all of this dread. The second one may take more to explain. I get the feeling that Catelyn is a little like a vessel for everybody's grief, kind of absorbing and holding on to everyone else's grief for them. We get a lot of contrasts in the book between her feeling grief and fear and sadness and the people around her feeling hope and joy and her kind of caught between staying silent so that she doesn't puncture their joy with her grief. She doesn't want to puncture it but also there's another side of her that's a little annoyed that they should get to be so carefree. There's that quote from earlier, Catelyn wished that she could share his joy, but she had heard the talk in yards, da da da, but she forced herself to smile at this man she loved. Or does this, were they good dreams, brother? Do you dream of sunlight and laughter and a maiden's kisses? I pray you do. Her own dreams were dark and laced with terrors. Or this? If he was more comfortable with his young queen, she could scarcely blame him. Jane makes him smile, and I have nothing to share with him but grief. There's many, many occasions everyone else is celebrating victories in battles or weddings or whatever it is, and she is always the voice saying the complete opposite or thinking the complete opposite. She does not join in in the celebrations unless forced to. She sits alone somewhere to brood or to pray or to puncture war councils by telling them their victories are nothing special, worse will be coming. All of which instantly makes me think of group dynamics, which is a big old box of chaos to be opening up for a video, so I will just say this. Our past experiences tend to leave us with certain types of roles we naturally lean towards taking up within groups. Not always the same rules, not always so rigid, but just some things we tend to lean towards. And for Catelyn, one of those typical roles seems to be the brooder, I guess, the downer. Um, it's a little like a division of labour. She'll interject all the projected feelings of grief and worry and sadness from the group so that they can focus on different roles, like the leader, the joker, the hotheads. Um, and the typical thing that might happen in this kind of scenario is people get a bit fed up with someone like Catelyn bringing everything down. They might feel it'd be so much easier if she just wasn't there, but then say she is gone, suddenly there isn't this person they can project all their sadness and worry and grief onto. Suddenly they all have to sit with it themselves again. With all that in mind, I think back to how she was with her son Bran. Bran was pushed out of a tower window, certain to be crippled by the fall. Mace Lewin was pretty sure he'd survive, however Bran still hadn't woken up yet, it wasn't certain, and Catelyn spent all of her time right next to him, not doing anything else but grieving and tending to Bran and watching over him. She had been there, day and night, for close to a fortnight. Not for a moment had she left Bran's side. She had her meals brought to her there, and her chamber pots as well, and a small hard bed to sleep on, though it was said she had scarcely slept at all. She fed him herself, the honey and water and herb mixture that sustained life. Not once did she leave the room. And we see Rob get annoyed with her because, you know, she has other children, she has duties as the Lady of Winterfell, and Rickon needs her, and so does Rob himself, but she just cannot leave Bran, and she's even a little snappy with Rob at first for suggesting that he should. She seems snappy as well that Ned still went off to King's Landing despite Bran's fall, because her total focus is absorbed in this role of grief, and grief alone. It takes Rob being a little more forceful with her before she hears him. His voice broke with sudden emotion, and Catelyn remembered that he was only 14. She wanted to get up and go to him, but Bran was still holding her hand, and she could not move. You know, she's holding Bran's hand, Bran is asleep, but she feels, um, symbolically I suppose, like it would be letting go of him and abandoning him to get up and move, so she can't bring herself to do it. She watches this endless vigil over Bran the way she sort of does much later on when her father Hoster is slowly dying in Riverrun. She sits for hours by his bed too, and then you get this reflection from her. 
She was no stranger to waiting, after all. Her men had always made her wait. Watch for me, little cat. Her father would always tell her when he rode off to court, or fair, or battle. He did not always come when he said he would, and days would oft times pass as Catelyn stood her vigil, peering out between the crannels and through arrow loops until she caught a glimpse of Lord Hoster on his old brown gelding, trotting along the river shore towards the landing. Did you watch for me? He'd ask when he bent to hug her. Did you, little cat? And so reading that, you kind of realise she has spent all her life standing vigil, waiting, looking over others she fears are in danger. Of course she plays this kind of loose role as the griever. In this strict society of Westeros, the men get to rush off into battle and all sorts. They don't have to sit with the grief or with the uncertainty because, you know, they can act. They can run from all of that into certain danger instead. Not that one's better than the other, they're different, you know. It's the women instead who are left behind with the uncertainty, with the waiting, the not knowing what's happening, but fearing the worst, hoping the best. Of course then she plays that kind of role. Fighting is better than waiting, Brian said. You don't feel so helpless when you fight. And when you think about it, that literally is the experience of feeling something awful is going to happen that you are powerless to do anything about beyond perhaps pleading to the gods. So yeah, I think that then also ties into this general fear of Catelyn's. And you know, as much as Hoster having Catelyn wait for him is meant to be a very loving thing between them, and it definitely is, you know, despite that it's also got to be pretty horrific to inadvertently be told to stand vigil, constantly on the lookout for if your father is going to come back home or not. I would have thought it'd be much better to reassure her and encourage her not to wait so fixedly that it will be okay, that she's allowed to carry on with the rest of her life until such a day he does return, rather than kind of being told to drop everything to wait for him. Which is how it must have felt on one level, you know, that's not at all how Hoster would have meant for it to feel, but I imagine that would, it would partly have that effect. Let's not get bogged down in this though, let's move on. Catelyn is burdened by this inescapable fear of tragedy befalling her and everything she cares about. What then does she do about this feeling? How does she respond to it? So our first insight into Catelyn's decision-making process comes when King Robert asks her husband, Ned, to go back to the capital and become Hand of the King, advisor to the King, essentially. A hell of a position. One that in the show Catelyn doesn't want Ned to accept, but in the books it's actually the reverse. Ned doesn't want to accept because he belongs in Winterfell and he thinks the South is a nest of vipers. See my video on Ned Stark. Whereas Catelyn instead is stuck on this omen of the dead direwolf in the snow with a broken antler lodged into its neck. As we've established, she's naturally very fearful of disaster, so this omen is going to be doubly a worry for her. A wolf, the symbol of House Stark, found dead from an antler, the symbol of House Baratheon, right before King Robert Baratheon calls on Ned Stark to become his hand. In her eyes, that's a huge danger. And this is literally a prophecy right at the beginning of the book. Um, people forget this one when they talk about prophecies in George R. R. Martin's world. Anyway, her thinking then, rather than to refuse Roberts and to hide away in Winterfell and stay back from this danger, her thinking is to accept this offer and to seek it out, which is very interesting. It makes her a direct opposite to her sister Lysa, Lysa being very defensive, who chooses to run from all danger and fortify herself behind the vast walls of the Eyrie. Maybe not a direct opposite, you know, because aggressive or or offensive don't feel like quite the right word for Catelyn, but rather than hide away, she chooses to meet the dangers, to try and prevent them or defeat them. Seek it out early before it grows into anything, you know? Um, at least that's initially what she does. How that changes in her character is interesting. So yeah, when Robert asks her husband to be Hand of the King, she encourages him to go because if you refuse to serve him, he will wonder why. And sooner or later, he will begin to suspect that you oppose him. Can't you see the danger that would put us in? 
Which again, probably isn't true. Ned's and Robert have been great friends, but Catelyn is forever half expecting disaster, so we can understand her interpretation here. And then, when they're told the Lannisters murdered Jon Arryn, she feels they definitely have to go south now and get to the roots of this. Catelyn also planning on going too, by the way, it's only Ned who insists that she stays behind in Winterfell. And then Bran falls from the tower window and her vigil for him begins and then after an assassin comes for Bran she chooses again to face the dangers. She travels herself to King's Landing to learn about the dagger and try and figure out who sent the assassin when Tyrion spots her on the road. Rather than try and play it off before hurrying back to Winterfell in defence, her instinct there is to seize him. A decision we'll discuss more later by the way, I know a lot of people have big thoughts on that decision, but her instinct is this more offensive one again, and then her instinct is to try and bring the Eerie into this conflict. So she goes to Lysa, thinking they can get her troops, and then when she hears Rob has called the banners, it's to go straight to him, and then to River Run to try and help politically with the war. You know, she's not gung-ho, I should point out, and again, not aggressive. Danger and worry and grief lay very heavily on her. She's not keen to have armies charge forth the way, you know, Cersei is, or most of Rob's bannermen are. She is a contrast to all the brash glory seeking. I would say she's more like a mother who bears her teeth when her cubs are threatened. Each of the seven embodies all of the seven, Septon Osmond had told her once. There was as much beauty in the crone as in the maiden, and the mother could be fiercer than the warrior when her children are in danger. Yes. After all, she goes to Rob's side mainly to support him as a mother, and equally keen to support Edmure as his big sister. So I think we can loosely say, yeah, she's less on the defensive, more on the offensive side of how to deal with dangers, which is loose, and obviously there are problems with this interpretation, one being she's hardly keen to seek out any dangers when Bran falls from the tower window. After his fall, you know, suddenly never mind King Robert or who murdered John Aaron or anything because Bran might die. She doesn't originally know he was pushed, she doesn't even actually stop to consider that because at the time her headspace is just suffocated in guilt, feeling like this was her fault because she prayed to the gods that Bran didn't have to go to King's Landing with Ned, that he could stay in Winterfell with her, which is an interesting prayer in itself. It's one of the things I've not come to a conclusion about. Why was Bran her favourite? Why was she so keen on him particularly to stay behind? What made are so particularly fearful of his safety. If you have any answers to that, I'm interested, but um, yeah, she prays to the gods that he should stay in Winterfell, then he falls from this tower and so can't go south. Did her prayers cause that to happen? Is she then guilty? It's magical thinking and we can fully understand why she feels that way. I think it would make her feel terribly guilty. And so naturally then, feeling like she's been a horrible mother who caused her son harm and possible death, she now watches over him obsessively, either as an act of redemption or of self-punishment for her prayer, um, and obviously also as an act of love and general fear, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I think we can empathise with wanting to stay beside the bed of your possibly dying son. And then someone tries to murder Bran. An assassin comes in that she wrestles with until Bran's direwolf Summer mauls the assassin to death, and I think it does several things. One, it makes her realise Bran's fall was not her fault, it was someone trying to kill him. If an assassin came, someone clearly wants him dead. Hang on, Bran wouldn't fall from a tower, would he? He was a perfect climber, someone must have pushed him. She realises that, then, which I think frees her from a lot of her guilt. To the threat of death here she's been worrying about is over, you know, she couldn't leave his side for fear something might happen, well, now it has, the assassin has come and it has been dealt with. Three, that Summer can guard Bran far better than Catelyn can. If she needs to protect her children, her way of doing that is a different world, she can rely on Summer now to be guard, what she has to do is play the role of soft power politics, figuring out who wants Bran dead and why, and then stopping them. So yes, I'm literally just explaining the motivations from the book there, but people I think seem to misunderstand why she leaves Bran and accuse her of being a bad mother over it, so it's useful for me to um, highlight exactly what's going on there. The second problem is that 
even if we overlook this brown scenario, Catelyn simply does not always seek to face the dangers. She often does, but it is conflicted with this side of her that's keen to negotiate with the enemy. A big part of which is because, yeah, she can't just bare her teeth to defend her children, owing to the fact her children are scattered all across Westeros, and I think the strain this place is of feeling like she's being constantly pulled in different directions for all of her children, I think that has an impact. As does the fact, as far as she knows, the Lannisters have both Sansa and Arya. Cersei is 100% the sort of woman who might kill them at a moment's notice. The Lannisters have already executed Ned, in that sense, of course she's open to trading. Her one big concern is getting her children back. The most obvious way to get them back is through a trade. But then she gets a bit more desperate. Um, releasing Jamie Lannister on the slim chance he both reaches King's Landing through Brienne's help and agrees to send back Sansa and Arya in exchange. It isn't great thinking, it's very desperate. Coming right after the news that Theon has murdered Bran and Rickon. Look, there is a point I've been attempting to make in this entire section and I haven't done it very well yet, which is that if we take the idea Catelyn is extremely fearful of some unknown mystical tragedy that is going to befall her and her family. If we accept she's very fearful with that belief, we then see her in conflict about it. On the one hand, fighting very hard to try and prevent this fear coming true, and on the other hand, feeling so powerless in the face of this incalculable tragedy that all she can do is plead and pray. And that, as things increasingly go wrong and she feels more and more powerless in the face of this tragedy, again a tragedy that feels a bit mystical or like the fate of the gods to her, not just the work of the Lannisters but something kind of more divine. As she feels more powerless in the face of this, she falls further and further into desperate pleading. The fight goes out of her, I suppose you could say, and we see her pleads a hell of a lot in her chapters, lots of quotes like, Let him grow taller, she asked the gods. Let him know sixteen, and twenty, and fifty. Let him grow as tall as his father, and hold his own son in his arms. Please, please, please. And in her final moments of life, she is holding a dagger desperately to the throats of a fool named Jingle Bell, pleading with Lord Walder to let Rob go, and... When that fails, we see her madly pleading to Ned. Our children. Ned's. All our sweet babes. Rickon. Bran. Arya. Sansa. Rob. Rob. Please, Ned. Please make it stop. Make it stop hurting. Which is a devastating end to her story. Uh, except it's not the end. That's what we're coming on to next. Just two takeaways from this first. One is that... In Catelyn's experience now, praying and pleading with the gods does not work. They are monstrous cruel, and so are the Lannisters and Freys and Boltons. Cruel and unfair, and something that would then twist all of that desperate pleading we've seen into an incredible fury in its place. And secondly, there has been so, so much grief for Catelyn now. Ned, Hoster, Bran, Rickon, Rob. She thinks the phrase may have also killed Edmure, and she might very well expect Sansa or Arya to have been killed. She is bombarded with so many losses that she barely has time to process them. She has little moments of reflection here and there, but often she's telling herself she has to be strong for Rob's sake, or there are dangers at hand she has to think more of. But it gets harder and harder with more and more grief, particularly as she realises there's no one she can turn to for advice anymore. No one to tell her what a duty is, Ned's would have given her instructions, her father even. Her uncle Brendan Blackfish does help a little when he's around, but often he's not, he's off being a scout, and she otherwise feels alone. With a lot of grief and desperation, and then she dies. So this needs explaining for people who aren't familiar with the books. In the show, The Red Wedding happens. It's awful and Catelyn is killed. In the books, however, she comes back a few days later. Her murdered corpse is dumped into the river only for Arya's direwolf Nymeria to find it and pull her from the river where Beric Tondarian and his Brotherhood Without Banners then come across her. 
Beric Dondarrion, who has been brought back from death multiple times, feeling less and less himself each time, now opts to give his life for good in exchange for Catelyn's. Which probably could have been quite touching if Catelyn didn't come back to life so much uh, darker than she was before. Unable to speak from where her throat was previously cut, she now assumes leadership of the Brotherhood Without Banners and leads them on a merciless quest of vengeance to capture and execute anyone who played a hand in the events of the Red Wedding. Well, more than that, actually. She executes any Lannisters, Freys, or Boltons, even if they had nothing to do with it, no matter what age they are. She's brutal, hence why they called her Lady Stoneheart. And the popular opinion for this is that in George R. R. Martin's world, death has dark effects on a person. If someone is going to be resurrected, then they have to have lost something of themselves, be changed in some sort of way, and this does seem to be his thinking. He's said this is what he thinks before. It's an idea I really like because it stops resurrection feeling just like a contrived plot element. Nonetheless, the argument that Catelyn has simply turned dark and a bit mad because of being dead for three days before her resurrection, it's an argument that seems too simple, I think. Because I reckon Catelyn was kind of heading in this direction regardless. Let's think about vengeance. It's a word that comes up a lot in her chapters, mostly a thing said by the slightly more gung-ho men, because that's a thing they can do. Again, rather than sit with the grief, they can charge out and act and hope a good spot of revenge wipes the slate clean. She sees it kind of like just a ridiculous stock phrase people say to her. Instead of, I'm sorry for your loss, it's all, I'll make the Lannisters pay for this stuff. How they loved to promise heads, these men who would be king. I'd say there is an element of boys and their stupid toys that she feels about this sort of talk, which again fits with the argument of her being this vessel for everybody else's grief. Half glad, half resentful that they don't sit with it too. But yeah, she often snaps at people about the idea of vengeance. The Lannisters will pay, I swear it. You will have your vengeance. Will that bring Ned back to me? She said sharply. She convinces Brienne not to go blindly chasing after Stannis for revenge, but to fight for the living instead. She urges Rob to think less of vengeance than of getting Sansa and Arya back, and then she starts to change. For two main reasons, as far as I see it. One being the more loved ones she loses, the more the gods ignore her desperate pleas, the more fury she then harbours. And the second being the more loved ones she loses, the less she has anything to fight for except vengeance and revenge. By the time she's Lady Stoneheart, she thinks all her sons are dead, that Arya could be dead but certainly isn't held captive by the Lannisters. The Brotherhood Without Banners will have told her of their encounter with Arya. She knows that if Arya is about, she's not with them, and also she knows that Sansa has escaped the Lannisters' clutches. Catelyn herself has already died, she doesn't have anyone or anything to lose at this point by waging war. More than that, she doesn't have much purpose other than vengeance. I mean, we don't know what she feels at this point in the story. She has no point of view chapters as Lady Stoneheart, but if you're miraculously brought back from the dead, surely you'd believe you've been brought back for some reason. What logical reason could she imagine for being resurrected and suddenly finding herself placed in charge of a large gang of outlaws, other than to enact revenge on the Lannisters, Freys, and the Boltons? That just seems the obvious conclusion you'd come to. There has been a hell of a lot of rage building inside Catelyn all throughout the story. Of course there has, she has suffered so much undeserved tragedy. All of that rage was kept shut down because A, she had to be strong for Rob, and B, she channeled it instead into pleading, to praying to the gods. You know, you can't be praying to them for help and then getting angry with them at the same time. They're hardly going to listen to you if you're getting angry, so <laughs> she suppresses all of the rage. She stays more like the dutiful person she's known to be. But the more the gods ignore her, the more she suffers, the more it's all building. Becoming Lady Stoneheart is the moment this rage is fully let loose and completely consumes her. However, as I said, we can track this rage building and this disregard for the idea of revenge or vengeance slowly getting reversed throughout the story. You know, because at first she tells Brienne to fight for the living, not for the dead, and next she says, I want them all dead, Brienne. Theon Greyjoy first, then Jaime Lannister and Cersei and the Imp, everyone. 
everyone but my girls my girls will so we can see the desire is there it's just the fear for her daughters at that point that's holding her back and then her second chapter in a storm of swords it is too late for ifs and too late for rescues Catelyn said all that remains is vengeance and then this really interesting bit Right before the Wed Reading happens, Roose Bolton tells her and Rob that his son Ramsay has captured Theon and is holding him, torturing him. And Roose Bolton offers Catelyn some of Theon's flayed skin for the suffering that Theon caused her, which should be a pretty horrifying gift. You were their mother, my lady. May I offer you this small token of revenge? Part of Catelyn wanted to clutch the grisly trophy to her heart but she made herself resist. Put it away, please. Flaying Fionn will not bring my brothers back, Rob said. You know, now it falls to Rob to criticise vengeance, not Catelyn. She feels she shouldn't relish it, but you can see the temptation plainly there to take a piece of Fionn's flayed skin as a trophy and clutch it to her heart. And then if we do go again to her last moment of life, holding Aegon Frey, the innocent fool named Jingle Bell, with a dagger to his throat, pleading with Lord Walder. When her plea fails and all hope is lost, when there is now no objective reason to kill this boy Aegon, he is innocent of everything. And Walder has already suggested he doesn't really care if he dies, it's not even much of a vengeance, but nonetheless she cuts open Aegon's throat as a final act before death. And act of rage. She's not just turned mad by resurrection, this is someone lost in her grief and rage now. Perhaps a somewhat fitting parallel to another character of the Stark family who becomes half consumed by vengeance, making lists of all the people she means to kill. That's an interesting thought. It's sad though to see her go from someone who doesn't really seem to want to cause soldiers death in battles, she wants to avoid that, and in her journey to the airy, it weighs heavily on her heart when any of her party have to be killed as a result of the stone men. She goes from that to now quite happily waging war and killing everyone, regardless of the costs and the consequences. As for what happens next to her in the story, all I think you can really say with accuracy is that either she will become so consumed with her rage that it will get her killed at the hands of someone like Jamie or her own brotherhood revolting against her. Either that, or that faint glimmer of purpose left to her life beyond just revenge. The faint hope of recovering Sansa and Arya still, could that be enough to bring some of her humanity back? Could that hope save her from destroying herself? Now the next bit, here we go. So as I said, a lot of people seem to detest Catelyn, and if you're one of those people and you've stuck with this video all the way to here despite that, then credit to you. You know, even if you still disagree, it's nice of you to stick this long and listen. All the same, I do not think she's a conniving, selfish sociopath or whatever that phrase was. Um, and while this section won't exactly be breaking down her psychology, it will be offering some defence for some of the things she is often attacked for. Although this first point I have to make isn't a defence because it would be damn weird defending her for the way she treats Jon Snow. Don't get me wrong, she's not malicious, she's not violent, Violent from what we can infer, it's mainly a cold or disdainful look in her eyes and being quite snappy with him. Even more snappy than she's with Edmure, but um, she never also calls him by his name. All of which, yes, aren't directly malicious, but nonetheless would have a massive effect on any child growing up. Sometimes it is neglect, or the way someone looks at you or ignores you, or the seething disdain you can just feel they have for you that's the most damaging thing of all. And when people criticise her for telling Jon it should have been him that fell from the tower, I'm surprised they don't mention the rest of this treatment, which is worse. I can understand her telling Jon it should have been him when she's gone near two weeks without sleep, is lost to her grief and fear. Lots of family members say these kind of things, wish each other dead, tell each other they're the reason they want to die, none of it is good or nice. But it does happen. She's not at all good to John, and it's not pleasant, and I do really like what that adds to her character, to be honest, um, but they're not good things. All of that said, the context for her treatment of John is very important. 
It's not just that he is the son of Ned Stark's unfaithfulness, as far as she knows. The text tells us quite explicitly she can accept that. What bothers her is Ned bringing him back to Winterfell, telling everyone quite publicly that Jon is his son, and involving him in near everything alongside his other sons. The context then is that politically Jon could be a threat to her children one day. He's bastard born, but he certainly isn't treated like that. And what's more, he looks like Ned Stark, looks more like Ned than any of her children do, far more than Rob. What if an older Jon Snow were to one day contest Rob's rule as Lord of Winterfell, or say Rob died and Jon made a claim for it ahead of Bran or Rickon? What if Ned has taught Jon so well in tactics and leadership that he comes to command the respect of a lot of Bannermen, and then they notice how much like like Ned Stark John looks, and in that sense, if he were to threaten her children's rights to their lands, would he then go far enough to kill them for it? Her fears aren't entirely misplaced. We see in the course of the story Rob wants to legitimise John and name him as his heir, and we see Stannis offers to legitimise John and make him Lord of Winterfell. <laughs> this could happen, she's not wrong in that sense, and it could cause a lot of complications. What's the obvious argument is of course John wouldn't do that to her children, of course he wouldn't threaten Rob's rule or murder him to take over or whatever. He grew up with them, he loves them. One, Theon goes on to turn on them, and two, as Catelyn argues to Rob, I know you trust John, but can you trust his sons? Or their sons? Which is a good question. And she mentions the history of the Blackfire Rebellions, where Aegon IV legitimised his bastards, and it led to some of the bloodiest conflicts in Westeros history that are still not settled and still quite possibly ongoing. And three, Catelyn is very, very fearful of this unknown potential danger that will cause her life to end in tragedy. We've already said this. We've also seen her react to Ned's best friend, King Robert, as a looming threat. It makes sense that she might also see Jon Snow that way. I think she's wrong to see him that way, I think it's incredibly unfair and cruel, but we can understand where it's coming from. And you know, when this is the thing she is most hated for by people in the books, even though Cersei treated her actual son Tommen way worse, even though Tyron treated all of his children way, way worse than Catelyn treated Jon Snow, I do find that odd. Catelyn does what she's expected to do, really. Her duty is to accept Ned's decision to raise Jon. Her duty is to raise her own children. Her duty, however, is not to raise Jon, to put it bluntly. This isn't a modern family, you know. Would it be damaging and bad for her to not care for Jon as a maternal figure? Yes, I think it would. I think it does have an effect on Jon. Is the social expectation, however, of Westeros that she should care for him? No. Um, she does not deprive John or starve him, she just simply cannot bring herself to love or care for him. Again, I hope that doesn't sound like a defence here, it's not, I just think the context is important. What is a defence of Catelyn? Um, well this is the final section of the video. So one of the big reasons Catelyn is hated, it seems, is because People feel she's an idiot, which <laughs> isn't a reason in and of itself to hate her. Um, what this long video series by the Order of the Green Hands, alongside a lot of comments I've read from people about Catelyn, seem to be suggesting is that they dislike her being an idiot because her bad decisions resulted in the death or misfortune of many fan favourite characters. That and the criticism that she acts superior to others. Is there some argument for that? Yes, I think there probably is. Um, some of her decisions do have a very negative effect, and could the fact that she was the eldest favourite child in the family, leaving her in that difficult spot of feeling the pressure to be perfect. Could that fit into the idea of seeing her as superior? Uh, maybe. I wouldn't say she's particularly superior to many of the characters we encounter in the chapters, I'd say she's more being a mother to people, a sometimes snappy mother who has no patience for all the glory of war talk. For which, her attitude brings a lot of humanity back to scenes that might otherwise have been a uh, badass, I suppose. Nobody finds it cool to have the king's mother beside him, however, without her perspective and her reflections on grief and some of the 
tragedies of war, there would not just be a lot less humanity to some of the book's events, but it would also lose a lot of its theme. War causes death and loss and grief, and that is never pleasant. Catelyn is a view into all of that. Again, that detracts from some of the fun badassness that people might look for in these books, and I think that's possibly a reason she can be disliked. Although that's speculation, I don't know. I think it'd be fair if you do dislike her to set out a better argument in the comments if I'm wrong there. Um, anyway, she's called an idiot, and I wanted to say, no, she's not. <laughs> she's certainly flawed. A lot of her decisions certainly have a bad effect, but that doesn't necessarily make them stupid. It can mean there were external factors she wasn't aware of, or she took a risk that happened to end badly, or she made a good decision, just the enemy then made an even better decision in response to it, or whatever. Case in point. In the first book, Catelyn reflects about how war must be avoided at all costs. Costs, only to then, in the same chapter, abduct Tyrion Lannister as a prisoner, technically kickstarting the war at a time when A, the North were not yet prepared for it, and B, Ned, Sansa and Arya were down in King's Landing and therefore not yet safe. The thing is, Catelyn didn't intend to abduct him. She spots Tyrion entering this inn, and at first she attempts to hide from him. She does not want to be seen, and wants to pass by without confrontation. However, Tyrion spots her. And Tyrion is intelligent, you may know. Um, it wouldn't take much to figure out what Catelyn might be up to, to make inquiries when he returns to King's Landing, to warn his family. Would it be the worst to have him do that? Hard to say, she only has a split second to judge it but Ned's and her have both been very keen on discretion. And that discretion now has gone out the window the second Tyrion Lannister saw her in a very public inn. By capturing Tyrion, she prevents the Lannisters from possibly gaining the first strike. It buys Ned's a little more time from what would now be the inevitable loss of discretion. And if there is to be a conflict, they have a very valuable hostage in Tyrion, which could be used to trade or as leverage. That's a great upper hand to start the war from. Plus, Catelyn hopes taking Tyrion to her sister Lysa, who had already sent a secret message saying that the Lannisters had murdered her husband. Catelyn hopes this might encourage Lysa to offer her troops to their side of the conflict, which is her big mistake here thinking Lysa would offer support. And it's an understandable mistake, because Catelyn hasn't seen her sister in years. If truth be told, I fear you might not find your sister as helpful as you would like. She was puzzled. What do you mean? The Lysa who came back from King's Landing is not the same girl who went south when her husband was named Hand. Based on her memories of Lysa, she had no reason to suspect her sister would be so difficult and unhelpful. How... Very, very different the war could have all gone if the Knights of the Vale had joined in, you know? If the battle began with Stark, Tully, and Arryn united, also with a valuable Lannister hostage. She's not an idiot, she rolled the dice here with a good chance of coming off well, and unfortunately it didn't work because her sister isn't the same woman she used to be. And also another important point, they thought Tyrion was guilty of attempting to murder Bran. She hoped if they could get him to confess that would carry a lot of sway, and King Robert, who was still alive at this point, would listen. Again, she did not expect King Robert to be murdered, she did not expect Lysa to be so panicked. Catelyn kept trying to insist that Tyrion was her prisoner to do with as she saw fit, but Lysa wasn't interested, allowed herself to be tricked by Tyrion and then set him free, all while still refusing to lend her troops to the Stark and Tully cause. So the faults there are one trusting Littlefinger when he suggested that Tyrion tried to murder Bran, which was foolish but Catelyn hadn't seen Littlefinger at all since he was a boy who was madly in love with her and somewhat dismissed him as harmless, and B trusting Lysa. Those are her mistakes, not the actual act of abducting Tyrion in itself. That could have been fine. It wasn't. <laughs> Releasing Jaime Lannister is a much harder decision to defend, um, however I think that's less idiotic than it is desperate. She just found out Bran and Rickon had been killed, that they'd pretty much lost the North. Already they're losing the war at this point, and she's starting to feel suing for peace might be their best way out of it. And if it was a proper exchange rather than just sending Brienne, there could have been some sense to it. We even let her get Rob say, I should have traded the King's Sire for Sansa when you first urged it. Rob said as they walked the gallery. If I'd offered to wed her to the Knight of Flowers, the Tyrells might be ours instead of Joffrey's. 
I should have thought of that. It's a bad move, but one we can understand. Equally, so was Edmure then warning Roos Bolton to look out for and capture Jamie, trusting that Roos Bolton would give him back to them. <laughs> Suddenly I'm starting to notice a theme that a lot of the faults here are based on trusting the wrong people. And a worse mistake than even that was Edmure preventing Tywin's forces from crossing the river. Rob wanted Tyrion to cross, luring him into the west where he could have been trapped and isolated. Instead, Edmure fought bravely and with tactical skill, but preventing that from happening, Tyrion was held off long enough for a message to reach him that Stannis was attacking King's Landing, so Tywin turned around, rode the King's Landing's defence instead, saving the capital, thwarting Stannis and allying the Tyrells to Lannister. That was a pretty massive turning point in the war. What's my point? It's that a lot of things went wrong. You know, same with Rob marrying Jane Westerling, same with with Ned refusing Renly's offer of support, or trusting Littlefinger, not imagining Tywin and Walder Frey would break the laws of hospitality. People make it sound like Catelyn single-handedly damns the entire cause with some stupid decisions, when, like, half the point of George's entire story is that ruling is very, very difficult. That everyone gets it hard, that everyone makes mistakes, that everyone is thrown into situations where they can't foresee the outcomes. Yes, she made mistakes, but to hate her for those mistakes as though she's the cause of everything wrong to happen in the whole story? The Order of the Green Hand video series attaches a kill count to apparently everyone Catelyn has caused the deaths of. Bringing our Cattle and Tully body count to... I have no idea. It's got to be well into the thousands at this point. Half of them are really flimsy, I think, and, and I know they're being flippant in doing that. Um, I shouldn't criticise it too much, but all the same, you know? As a final point, because I'm now getting into this, despite my throat's very much dying, I'll discuss the reason they consider Catelyn a selfish sociopath. It's because way back when Catelyn got that secret letter from Lysa about how the Lannisters murdered Jon Arryn, Catelyn doesn't show Ned the letter. She reads it herself and then burns it. Maester Lewin offered it to her instead of Ned, which is a bit odd, and I can see exactly what got them suspicious about this scene. Nonetheless, they take all that to mean that this whole thing was pre-planned, that Maester Lewin coming in with this mysterious letter, planned by her as a way to convince Ned to go south because her huge ambitions wanted Sansa to become queen. And I know this section isn't going to be interesting now for anyone who isn't already aware of this, but um, to make my argument, <laughs> If it was pre-planned, why would her own point of view chapter have her so obviously distressed by this letter? Catelyn could feel the dread stirring inside her once again. What is it they would have her see more clearly? She reached and took the letter in trembling hands. The furs dropped away from her nakedness, forgotten. I don't see her acting trembling hands and just letting her body become exposed in front of Maester Lewin simply for acting sake, particularly in her own point of view chapter where her feelings are supposed to be made plain to us. It's not some great scheme against her husband here, she wants him to go south for the exact reason she states in the chapter that she's terrified by this omen of the dead direwolf. She fears what will happen if Ned refuses Robert and if they don't uncover the truth of John and Aaron's murder. If it was all about ambition, why then after Bran's fall from the window does she try convincing Ned not to go south anymore, but to stay? They also state in their video that Ned gave her strict instructions of what to do after she visits him in King's Landing. She is to go back to Winterfell, then send words to Helm Tallheart and Goldblood Glover to fortify Moat Kaelin, have Lord Manderley ready his defences, and to keep a close eye on Theon Greyjoy. And the video argues that because she's such a self-serving, reckless person that she completely ignores these instructions to instead just arrest Tyrion and go off on her own adventure. But as I said, Tyrion spotting her changes the situation, it affects the plan, she is forced to make a snap decision. The video makes out that she doesn't send messages to the North to prepare her defences, but she does, as soon as she reaches the Airy, she seeks the Maester to do just that. She had other messages to send as well, commands that Ned had given her for his bannermen to ready the defences of the North. She does exactly as Ned tells her to, and then even before Tyrion's trial, she intends to head straight back to Winterfell. 
She travels as far as White Harbor, where she then learns Rob has called the banners, so she instead rides after him, which is the correct decision. She trusts the direwolves to defend Bran and Rick and right now. Rob needs greater help and she can't be in two places at once. Continuing on, I hope this isn't getting laboured, but um, their video suggests that she does a horrendous job with advising him and that he wants her gone, but he doesn't. Her support helps give him a lot of confidence. Her relationship with Rob is meant to be a direct opposite to Lysa's relationship with Robin. There are a lot of quotes of her supporting and encouraging and telling him the cold truth in all the ways that Rob needs. And yes, at points they disagree and they have stressful arguments over it, but yeah, same with all the Bannermen. They all have different opinions about the war, their lives all depend on, of course it gets heated at times. Of course Rob wants to be rid of her at times, he's very much at that age, especially having become a king where you want to separate from your parents and feel independent, but he is also in conflict over that, he wants that in moments, in others he feels the need for her support and to go to her. We're not supposed to just remove the nuance from the experiences of these stories, they're supposed to be conflicts for a reason, moral dilemmas where they feel one thing and also feel another thing. They argue in the video as well that she's an awful negotiator because she couldn't stop the fighting between Stannis and Randy, but who could stop them exactly? Especially when she's got absolutely zero authority over either of them and not much relationship to either of them either. They argue she's getting all power hungry when she rides as the person to negotiate with Lord Walder, but no, she knows how prideful Walder is. She has some vague acquaintance with him, which is more than any of the other Bannermen there, and when Rob and his people start arguing with Sir Stevron, she sees Sir Stevron is not pleased that Lord Walder will take offence and refuse him if they keep on arguing. A few more words and the chance would be lost. She had to act, and quickly. I will go, she said loudly. That's hardly being ambitious and self-serving, Catelyn is arguably a very unambitious character. All her motivations pretty much centre around either doing her duty or keeping her children safe. I know I've breezed through these points quite quickly, but I do think it is important I set out some vague arguments. You know, Catelyn is neither an idiot, nor is she evil. I feel like reducing everything down to black and white answers like that, that this person is awful, that Ned Stark is simply an honourable fool, that Tywin is simply a badass who wins, Cersei is insane. I feel like those sort of judgments remove the very thing that makes this story so special in the first place, which is the depth everybody has. No person is so one-sided that you can perfectly encapsulate them in a single judgement. That's a big reason of why these videos are always so long and a bit messy and ultimately flawed because I cannot fully encapsulate them. But I do still try and I hope you still enjoy it. Uh, leave your thoughts. It all doesn't make a big difference and I am genuinely interested to know what you think, what I missed, what I got wrong. And again, if you do hate Catelyn Stark with a passion, credit for allowing yourself to listen to this whole thing first, but now also take your chance to tell me why you feel that way. Well, that's, that's only fair that I listen in return. If you want some other questions to answer in the comments and help me out, there was that one about why she feels so much for Bran or whatever it was I said, and there's also the question, why is it you think Ned never told Catelyn who Jon Snow's mother was? Was he keeping strictly to the oath? Did he not trust her? Was there another reason? I've left that open. Um, Subscribe for more, though check out my other character analysis videos, I have several different playlists. Support me on Patreon if you really want to help, and thank you again to World Anvil, but otherwise, hope to see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Luke Kaur, Trichu Kaber, Michael Gallagher, InSquares, Flying Spider, Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Follier, and Jab Bramwell. Thank you.